How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Oh, yeah. You know, there is an energy and enthusiasm that you bring to this, Mark, every time. I am so delighted. It's just wonderful to have you here. Very delighted to be here. It's great. So we are, we are hoping to have a guest tonight because it's, you know, there's so much going on uh, in the stock market. And, you know, if nothing else, I think we're going to just riff on it because I honestly don't understand a lot of what this stuff is about. But hopefully we'll be able to do a deeper dive into it. It really shocked a lot of people, Mark. What happened? Well, well, let's talk about what you're, you're saying though, right? You're a well-educated professional doctor and there's things that you don't know. True. Now there, there are people who are very much involved in the stock market and don't understand what's going on. And I think it's the bigger picture that we're going to be talking about with a lot of other financial professionals is money. What is it? Who controls it? Why does it do certain things to certain people? How, why do people have different relationships with money? And how is it that there are a small number of people controlling an enormous amount of money? Right? Is the system rigged? I think we heard that a lot in the last 10 days. Is the system rigged against the small, quote, retail investor, the you and me's, the folks that are investing on free trading apps like Robinhood, right? Folks are hearing a lot about Robinhood, the app that was used in the GameStop, uh, the Reddit revolution we're liking to call it. But there are hedge funds and What does that mean? What is a hedge? I mean, I, when I think of a hedge, I think of something you know how, outside the building. So they're extremely, hedge. extremely sophisticated investment strategies where mm -hmm. you have somebody who's in charge, who's managing a portfolio of investors' money, a lot of money. Right. Typically, folks like you and I would not be investing in a hedge fund because we wouldn't be eligible. Right. You have to have certain financial uh, criteria in order to be admitted to this club. Right. Really? To be allowed to to invest in a private fund, very unregulated industry, which is what I'm really interested in seeing is when um, Congress and the Senate start to hold hearings, which should be as soon as next week, I think, where folks are going to testify about what happened. But I think what's going to come of it, more than anything, is some stronger regulations around these investment funds and what they're doing and why not everybody has access to the same information, data, speed of transactions. Is the game rigged in their favor? I don't know that I'm prepared to say that, but I'm really interested to see some sworn testimony about it because I don't fully understand what's going on. I'm not in that space. Like that is not my world. I don't have a B next to my net worth. A lot of these hedge fund managers, owners, of these um, investment vehicles are multi-billionaires. One of the things that came, came back to surface recently was um, Bill Ackman, the, one of the gentlemen who owns and runs a hedge fund back in March screamed that the sky was falling down. Right. And, and it was, he presented a really 
authentic message that, you know, think this is really bad. And a lot of people paid a, a very close attention to what he had to say. He was very enthusiastic about it. But on the other side, he was, he was betting against the US economy and he made $2 billion, right? Was he being genuine and authentic as he was screaming and yelling that we're com- the world is coming to an end? Or was he making the market shift? Was he manipulating the market? Market making, they call that. And that's not supposed to happen. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not some of these folks are are called to task and held accountable for it, or if it's going to get broomed under the rug. I, you know, Thomas, you were following this really closely. We talked about it briefly last week, but it seems pretty quiet this week, doesn't it? Is the is it is it me or did this get silenced a little bit already? Yeah. Well, the conversation where I've been observing it hasn't died down. I think that on uh, say. CNN or CNBC, you'll they'll have headlines like as the GameStop story fizzles out, R slash Wall Street bets is focusing more on silver now, where that's not exactly the case. They're not a hive mind, but they'll also say we on the whole aren't doing the silver thing. We're still pumping up GameStop. This is still about hurting Melvin Capital. So um, is that a ploy to distract? I think it's like a it's classic cointel pro it's as simple as making a reddit account or paying a few hundred or a few thousand people to make reddit accounts and divide and distract well i'll tell you i'll tell you what was most surprising to me dr joe as a robin hood account holder who has had an account and enjoys the freedom of making trades without cost and having financial information at my fingertips and watching what my average cost was. It it has been really fun and accessible to a lot of people, right? And a lot of people have been utilizing it through the pandemic. A lot of people who are home, a lot of younger people, right? A lot of people are making a lot of money in the stock market using Robinhood. But then you find out that they're owned with a majority ownership of hedge fund money, right? That was kind of shocking to find out that, you know, this, this Robin Hood, right? We're going to steal from the rich for the poor, right? But we're actually, we are the rich. And what was even more disheartening to find out is that Robin Hood was feeding the information of these retail traders to these hedge fund folks in advance of the trade going through. And I think Whoa. that's that's gonna be focused really heavily because they claim to have disclosed it. You know, and I'm I'm not, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not gonna sit and read all of the terms and conditions on all of the apps that I buy. But I looked at this one because it was financial. And I don't remember seeing that very clearly, <laughs> that they're gonna take our trade information and they're gonna flow it through to some folks that are going to pay them significant amount of money for that information to then speed trade around them. Right. So if I were to, in theory, if I were to buy a a share of Tesla at $825, by the time the trade goes through, it might be $825 and 50 cents. And I don't know if you all saw the movie office space, but you know, you can round off a penny a uh, you know, hundred million times and it starts to add up. Wow. I, I mean, that's got to be illegal, or at the very least unethical to say, hey, by the way, this person is about to do this with this stock. So you may want to do something like before or right after. I mean, but, 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 but I, I, I mean, I think we need to back up a bit. So, I mean, when I think of Robin Hood, I think of a guy in a green outfit with a bow and arrow who was robbing from the rich to give to the poor. That was the classic Robin Hood story. So the name in and of itself, something that's good for the common person, the average person, but what actually is Robin Hood? So you can, you can buy shares, trade shares. I mean, I, I think, 
you know, I mean, we need a, we need a basic understanding of what the stock market really is. Mark, so the, it, from your experience. Well, the, the, the irony of it is, is as this GameStop debacle, this Reddit revolution, if you will, has taken form, you're realizing they're not stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. They're stealing from the poor and giving it to the rich, right? So uh, that story aside, the stock market is, a, is an equities market, right? So companies can sell shares of their company, the equity in their company to the public market, right? But they have to follow a lot of strict rules and, and guidelines associated with it. And it's, it's all about disclosure. You know, it's, it's all about who has the information, right? Insider trading, right? There's been a right. speculation that there was some insider trading going on. But everybody feels as though that the market is fair. The question that's being raised right now is, is it really fair? Or is it, quote, rigged for a certain group of people, right? Is, is the large billionaire hedge fund model rigging and controlling and manipulating the system so that us small mom and pops are going to get smoked, right? I'm not going there yet, but um, it certainly is, is asking a lot of questions. And we're looking forward to the, the Senate hearings to, to hear most, spe most specifically that relationship about what Robinhood's trading platform was doing with that information. That's what okay. I'm most looking forward to seeing. But, 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 but again, we've got to back up a little Go bit ahead. more just to put this in a context. Um, so last week or so, I was told that this company GameStop, which is very popular, was not doing well financially. And there's a possibility that it was going to go out of business. And my understanding of what a short is in the market is that, and, and I really don't get it, you buy you are buying a stock, borrowing, borrowing a stock, and then you're hoping that the price goes down. And so when you give it back at the price so, that you bought, that so you break, break it down even more simply than that. Okay, so there's a, there's a share at $10, right? I'm going to borrow that share, but then I'm going to sell it in the hopes that it's going to go down so that when it goes down to seven, I buy it and sell it back at 10. So I've made $3 on that. So I borrow it at $10. I don't buy it. I borrow it, but then I sell it. I sell the borrowed share. So now when I have to return that share, my hope is that I can buy it for less than I sold it. So I borrow it at 10, I sell that borrowed share at 10, and then I buy it back at five. So now I've made $5 when I give it back, right? But if that can happen, guess what else can happen? That $10 share that I borrowed goes up to 15, 20, 300, 400, and now I need to give that back or I need to prove that I'm capable of giving that share back. But now it costs $400. Huh. So what happened, and they called this the short squeeze, is that they had to start buying some themselves. Well, who's they? So who's it they? Went, the folks that had borrowed the shares okay they started so, i'm sorry so I, I just want to try to explain this to people so these investors these hedge funds so they're hedging their bet that's what hedge Correct. means hedging your bet means you're gonna bet on something now and hope something changes later and you make money on it but they were doing something called a short was that right Yes, Not a short a is, a sh so think of it bigger than that. So a hedge fund is a fund that has multiple different, I don't want to use the term bet, 
but it is every multiple bets trades that are in play some are okay. long some are short some are derivative some are this that the other thing right so they're hedging saying if i buy this stock long i'm going to buy this one short so i'm going to hedge i'm going to mitigate i'm going to try to make as much money and lose as little money possible right so one of their bets was to short game stock this is this is Blockbuster 2.0. Nobody needs games anymore. They download everything. They're streaming everything. How could GameStop possibly be a viable company anymore? We're going to make sure it goes bankrupt, right? They're not saying that, but they're betting that it's going to go bankrupt. Now, what happened in this scenario was the perfect storm. Reddit is a community of like-minded people sharing ideas. Some of them game. What happened was at a certain point in time, not that long ago, a new CEO was put into GameStop. And there was right. a lot of enthusiasm behind this new leader that they could take them in a different direction. They could pivot, they could stay in the market. Everybody loves the brand. Maybe they can survive like Netflix did, right? Do you remember Netflix used to have you take a DVD, fold the envelope backwards and send it back? Well. They weren't, behind, they weren't gonna be far behind Blockbuster in the bankruptcy line if they continued going down the path with that model. So, but they pivoted, they shifted, they started streaming their content. Now they're making original content that's amazing and their stock is soaring and they're successful. But I can guarantee you that there were a lot of people betting that they were going to fail at one point in time. So when the hedge funds, the really smart, intellectual, sophisticated, we know more than anyone else about the market, started to see this enthusiasm. They saw this as a sucker's bet. They saw the Reddit folks as simpletons who are driving up a stock that has no way of succeeding. So we're going to short it. And what happens in the stock market is everything is disclosed. So it's, it was disclosed at how much this stock was being shorted. It was actually being shorted more than 100%. So in essence, it was unsustainable. You can't actually do what was happening. 138% of shares were being shorted. How does that happen? 100% is a full, full plate, right? So somebody who's local to us, I believe he's in Brockton, right, Tom? The, the fellow that, that identified this and rallied the troops and said, hey, folks, look what's going on here. Do you see this? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? What do you say well, we buy into this and squeeze these folks? Gentlemen, the Reddit well, revolution. Well, excellent. Thanks, guys. Sorry for the delay. A little hiccup on my end. No, no problem. We, I think we did a decent job doing the cliff notes, but I can't wait for Dr. Joe to dig in and really ask the questions that we're dying to understand. So we are so glad that you're here because, you know, I think that there is a nation of people who have no idea what happened a couple of weeks ago with Reddit and shorts and GameStop and what happened? What was this? All right, let, let me, um, it's, it's very timely, um, not, not to get too sentimental here, but it was my father's birthday today and he passed oh. away uh, six months ago. So um, oh. the reason I mention that is because he was an investor, professional investor, and he had a saying that I don't know why I rem remember this, but it's very appropriate. It, he said, he who bor borrows what isn't his and pays it back or goes to prison. And that's mm. essentially talking about shorts. So if you, if you borrow something, which is what happened with GameStop, and you sell it, but you don't own it, you ultimately have to pay it back. And essentially, that's what took place. So, you know, my kids shopped at GameStop for many, many years. I spent more money than I care to admit at GameStop. And I always thought that there was a problem with the, with the company because uh, I'd stand in long lines, and I won't bore you with the, the subtleties, but... Um, I never invested in GameStop, and I wasn't surprised when the stock was trading around $5, and then I wake up one day, and the stock's shooting up to $100, right? So 
what happened is hedge funds who thought they were smart and they are smart, borrowed GameStop shares from individuals who owned it and they sold it and got the proceeds. And then they basically had to buy it back. And a massive squeeze took place through Reddit, precipitated by the internet and communication on the internet. And you had a massive army of small individual investors throwing literally 10, 20, 30, 40, $50 at GameStop. When you multiply that times the millions, um, eventually shot the price up and the shorts, the hedge funds found themselves having to cover their margin calls from large institutions that were lending them the money on this trade. And it created, a, it created an avalanche, basically. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, so, so the, a number of, of phrases. First, I, I love that he who borrows what isn't his and pays it back or goes to prison. That's <laughs> terrific. Your dad must have been an amazing person to come up with that. <laughs> Wonderful. So what, first, a couple of things. What's a squeeze? What is a squeeze in this setting? Well, a, a squeeze is essentially uh, if I if I sold something at one hundred dollars, thinking it would go to zero, and it goes up to one hundred and ten dollars, I'm okay. I've lost ten percent. But what's my what's my potential loss? Unlimited, right? Whereas if I buy something at a hundred and it goes to zero, I can only lose a hundred dollars, but my gain is unlimited. So you flip that. And the squeeze is where the hedge fund has to post collateral for this massive, basically, loss that's growing proportionally. So if you borrow $100 and you owe the, the bank $200, the bank's going to come knocking. They're going to say, hey, we, we want some more collateral. Otherwise, the bank's on the hook. So, so does GameStop get any of this money? <laughs> uh, great question. So... The short, quick answer is no, but they could have exercised what's called a shelf offering. They could have sold additional stock. And I believe AMC actually did that. AMC actually said, my God, we have a shelf offering, which is something that they put in place probably years ago, saying that if they wanted to, they could issue additional stock, right, at a limited amount. And so AMC, I forget what the price went to with AMC, but GameStop, if they had a shelf offering, they could have issued additional stock up at $400 a share. So what's wonderful, Doug, is that there's this whole nomenclature, this whole language uh, around this, like a shelf stock and things. I mean, we need a dictionary for this, but, but in essence, as an investor, as somebody who's been doing this for 30 years, What's your take on what just happened? Well, you know, to be blunt, um, I don't consider it investing. Um, the hedge funds may differ. Uh, it is investing from that perspective, but from what the individuals were doing, and I've blogged about this, you know, I know Mark has read these, um, it was a disaster waiting to happen because what you need to re realize is that investors think that stock prices follow a logical step pattern in that if I buy something today at 100, then there's a buyer at 101, 102, 103, all the way up to 400. Not true. It's a marginal pressure on that price. So if there's a lot of demand for a stock that opens at 100, it can jump from 100 to 200 without hitting anything in between. Mm -hmm. So just you flip that around, when the music stopped and the chair was pulled away from the circle, GameStop was at 400. The next stop down, excuse the pun, maybe 300, 200, 180. And everybody, most of the people will never know this, but my bet is, my hunch is that if you were to basically chart, plot out where the purchases happened, a lot of them were above 250 to 300, even 400. And those people did not get out up there. They had dreams. I heard one story today on CNBC where... <laughs> One uh, individual, I forget, he was, he was a PhD student, I believe, at a Ivy League college, had to basically be, you know, had to be, he was thrown into therapy, shock therapy by his friends because he couldn't play tennis. He was checking his GameStop price every point. 
and they said, look, you need to sell. And he turned $250 into like $100,000, $200,000. He got out. Most people did not get out. They didn't mean to. Pardon me? Well, for a lot of them, it wasn't about making a profit. A lot of it was the joker setting the pile of money on fire, about sending a message. Well, that That's great. But I mean, if you're if you're only losing 50, 100 bucks, that's fine. And I, I don't I don't disagree or have a problem with that, but um, I'm sure they like making a profit on, on, at the same time, right? I mean, there, it's one thing if you can, you know, stick it to the the crowd that's setting up a trade that probably shouldn't exist, but it's another thing if you're if you're losing money on top of it, right? Hmm. Is there enough of a groundswell of of retail investors that they could actually dent the existence of the way the market is being? played right now? Well, you know, I mean, there are multiple ways to do it. I'll tell you, you know, what I have a, a strong belief in is the, the wisdom of crowds and the amount of intelligence that is out there. I drive a lot of my research off of a, a site called Seeking Alpha. And this, these are individuals that publish. There are hundreds, thousands of individuals publishing. And they're, they're in, in many cases, brilliant insights into companies you know I'll, I'll after i get off this call this video i'll get on seeking alpha for a couple hours i mean i'll wake up at 5 30 in the morning have new articles there and there's a lot of really good grassroots research that's done you don't need to be bankrolled by a billion dollar hedge fund um, and this is accessible to anybody i mean my 19 year old son upstairs He's following Seeking Alpha now, coming down here saying, hey, did you see this? Did you see that? This is all accessible to everybody where years ago, only the top institutions had access to this research. Tom, you were in the middle of, of asking Doug something and commenting. Yeah, uh, I'm also wondering like, because people have been talking about this for years about the possibility of Congress figuring out how to regulate crypto. Because we see we saw something very similar with crypto as the GameStop thing was happening. A lot of crypto wallet apps, similar to Robinhood, started deep platforming this cryptocurrency called Dogecoin. So you weren't able to buy it. And sometimes it would, they would even sell it on your behalf, which I think Robinhood did too, a few times with people's GameStop stocks. I have no idea how that's legal or how, how would you carry the conversation over the crypto market if you could? Oh boy. <laughs> Well, you know, some of the crypto is not true securities. So that's one thing, right? I mean, to buy Bitcoin, um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. And it's basically buying a holding company that owns Bitcoin in the background. And the challenge with that, not to go too far off track, is that you may be buying, you know, you know Fred Flintstone's crypto fund and Flintstone has the crypto behind it. But if there's too much demand, Fred's fund is going to trade above what the crypto is actually worth. So you're paying more for the underlying crypto, which people aren't really aware of. Um, shorting it, you know, the same methodology, um, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult to borrow because when you short something, you know, my, my mother, for example, who's a client of mine, uh, we had a, a, a stock that I won't name the name because I don't want to set off anything on, that I didn't mean to. But, um, Reddit, Reddit, listen to this, Reddit. <laughs> this, this was a, this is a, an innovative insurance, disruptive insurance company. And um, I got a call from my custodian and they said, can we borrow shares from your client? Uh, because we have a hedge fund that wants to short them. And we're going to pay her 19% per annum to borrow the shares, which is the same thing they do with GameStop. Um, but it's very difficult. My point being, it can be very difficult to find these shares. I mean, if they're calling me with my client who has 2,000 shares they need to borrow, 2,000 shares wasn't more than maybe $100,000, right? So with crypto, it can get very difficult. Any security that's niche in nature, it's very volatile. It's tough to find. So... Were you surprised by, by what happened last week? I was surprised, yes. Um, I wasn't surprised how, <laughs> how, how big the snowball got and how quickly it, it, it gathered momentum. 
but um, I was certainly surprised. I was surprised because I think a, a lot of these individuals, I would be surprised if they had a lot of faith in the actual company of GameStop. And maybe as Tom said, it was more stick it to the man than it was we have faith in GameStop. I mean, GameStop is turning around a little bit, but not anything that would justify a $400 valuation. Um, they're, they're still selling discs in an environment where everything's going subscription based. Um, and they're trying to sell boxes that, uh, you know, they can't get enough of. So you can get a um, target. Yeah, exactly. You can go to target, you can order them off Amazon. Um, you're having to buy them for a premium on, uh, you know, over the web from individuals who are hoarding them. So yeah, I think GameStop has a tough road ahead of it. That's what surprised me the most. Was the selection that they chose. Yeah. But, but see, that goes hand in hand with why it had such a high short interest, because the hedge funds thought they smelled, they smelled death in the air. So those kind of go hand in hand. And, and yet you were not surprised by the snowball. Why is that? Because, uh, you know, the crowd, the, 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 you know, the, the wisdom of crowds can turn into the panic of crowds. And um, when something gets such quick momentum, you oftentimes believe that you can get in and make a quick buck and get out before things fall apart. And the higher that goes, the smarter you think you are and the more you pile on. And, and yet what about this notion that, that Tom suggests that it wasn't about the money in this case, that people were willing to lose that 50 bucks or 75 bucks, maybe because they knew that if there were millions of them doing that, there may be a few people losing billions who maybe they thought didn't deserve to have it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were people that thought that, but I'm sure because I took a lot of calls from clients and prospects who wanted to make a quick buck. <laughs> okay. So there was a combination of both. Yes, and, I, and I, think, I think that's important to hear because it's not just about altruism. There's, there still is this, this, uh, this idea that I mean, I'd like to think it's a little bit more than buying a scratch ticket and scratching off and hoping that you win something. There must be a bit more to it than that because the stock market's been around a long time. Well, you know, as they say, in the, in the short term, it's a voting mechanism. In the long term, it's a measuring mechanism. And, um, you know, I, I took one call, I remember, I remember it actually was a text where someone asked, should I buy AMC? And I said, well, I'm not buying AMC, but if you want to buy AMC, did you look at the balance sheet? How much debt do they have in the balance sheet? And are they able to pay their debt? And if they can't pay their debt, they're going into bankruptcy. And if they go into bankruptcy, the stock gets wiped out. So I haven't looked at the balance sheet, but start there. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they bought the stock or not, but um, you know, th this is not, you know, it's like handing the keys to the Ferrari to someone who has never driven a car before. I mean, you know, a lot of us couldn't drive that car too well if we weren't, you know, used to it. But handing it to someone who's never been in a car before, it's very dangerous. So, um, you know, investing in stocks is not quite as easy as it may sometimes seem. I think that's, that's a wonderful analogy uh, for people to, to be able to take away. One of the things that we talk about here on the Dr. Joe Show is what I call the I am approach, where we think everybody's doing the best they can. We're influenced by four domains, our home domain, the social domain, the biological domain of your brain and body, and something I call the I see, how I see myself, how I think other people see me. There's been a huge social domain influence uh, through Reddit right now on another social institution, the stock market. But because these four domains interact in general, a small change can have a big effect. We don't need to change everything make a small change in any of the one domains, it can have an effect through the whole system. I think that's part of what we saw. There was this small change, but given the market, just shifting away from this for a moment, in your position, what small change could you recommend to our listening audience that they could do that may help them be more successful? Well, I, I love that. I love that setup there. Um, it's, it's perfect, uh, but it might not be a small change, although it's simple. Time and diversification. They're the two most powerful forces in investing. 
Um, there's a chart behind me. I didn't, well, this is by accident, but you can't really see it. It's a mountain chart going back to the early 1900s. Huh. And it shows every single major asset class. And it shows that over any period of 10 years or longer, if you had stayed invested, you never lost money. Okay. The, but the other thing is each of those lines there is an asset class. It's diversified. So those are the two things that most of us have the most trouble with if we're not versed and we're not trained in the capital markets is we like to pick one company or two companies. And we think that company subconsciously, we think that company knows the second we bought it, that I bought it and it better go up, right? Sometimes, first of all, stocks never know you bought them, right? And, and second of all, they can take years. I mean, I tell people sometimes why don't you sell that dog? It hasn't done anything. I said, the second we sell it, I guarantee it'll spike up, right? right? right. So buy a diversified portfolio, more than two or three stocks, more than a dozen, and hold on to them for the long term. That'd be great. So again, to, to get into the, the I am approach, the idea is that everybody has an I am. Everybody's doing the best they can. And because of this I see domain, we are interested in how other people see us which has an effect on our brain. Because if you think about it, you know, it feels better to feel valued and respected than disrespected. When's the last time you got angry at someone treating you with respect, right? So because of that, you control no one and influence everyone because you're part of someone's home domain or social domain. You have an effect on their biological domain through their IC, the way they think you see them. So what I usually ask our guests is, what kind of influence do you want to be? You get to choose. What kind of influence does Doug Beck want to be? And you want me to answer that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I don't know that I can nail that on the spot. Um, what I would say is what I, what I try to do is influence others by, you know, giving part of myself that I feel I'm best at, right? So, um, for example, uh, I, I was involved with a group called Defy in New York City, who takes uh, formerly incarcerated individuals and trains them, puts them into a shark tank competition, essentially, after giving them a crash course in MBA type, how to write a business proposal, mathematics, writing, syntax, syntax etc. Um, and that was incredibly useful. I mean, I still have people that I keep in touch with as friends who couldn't get a job at McDonald's and are now running successful businesses because of that program. Great. Um, I have a, a new, a new um, mentee who's, who's also a friend now. He was incarcerated for uh, 23 years, uh, life without parole. He murdered someone and uh, in, in prison in California for 23 years at the age of, I believe he went in at 20. So he got out at 43, just four months ago. And he's a, he's a phenomenal artist, obviously had to change in prison to have his commute, his sentence commuted by governor Brown at the time. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm teaching him just little baby steps about investing, how to save. It's not even about investing strike that it's about how to save and how to put personal habits in place that can set him up to eventually be self-sufficient because no surprise, he's not self-sufficient right now. Um, so I don't know if that kind of hits on the most. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a powerful influence because from my, my perspective as a psychiatrist, what this really means is that you are seeing him as valuable and mm -hmm. reminding him of his value. And that is what everybody wants. You know, we talk about this on the I Am and the Dr. Joe show that, you know, think about everybody you've ever met. They just want the same thing, which is just to feel valued by somebody else. And using the I Am approach at every and any moment in time, you can remind someone of their value. And whenever you remind someone of their value, you increase your own value. Definitely. Right? And that's about respect. Respect leads to value and value leads to trust. And trust is the foundation of, of everything that we do, I believe. 
you know, th this this has leveraged itself. So I I also kicked off a, uh, a, a finance 101 course that um, I've thrown out there on Facebook for individuals just first come first serve. And I really, I really teach it customized for an audience of, or you know, a class of three people or so. And my first one that I kicked off, I had an individual join who, I'll, I'll, I'll keep him anonymous, but 23-year-old um, based out west. Um, he's a pretty prolific YouTuber now, and he dropped out of uh, college after his first year because he just wasn't challenged. And uh, he started a business through his own innovative networking, of giving giving free content that he felt was helpful out over, you know, the, the internet and the various, the various outlets. And he's now grossing 30 to $35,000 a month um, wow. through, through a niche business, which again, I won't divulge that niche business, but sure. it, was, it was only all he had to do was synthesize and, and put this content out there and you know it just blossomed and the content wasn't really core to what his business was but it just gained him that exposure and that credibility that parlayed into his, his current business so um yeah, I mean, it's, it's just it's incredible the confluence of factors that we have today but how, how do you monetize something like that i mean it's a wonderful idea but how well, who pays him so i'm 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 still learning from him. I mean, we can always, we, we can all learn from anybody, you know, different walks of life, ages, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. And I pulled him into the relationship with my mentee. And yesterday I was coming back from a trip and he actually was doing a video with my, my mentee who just got out of prison four months ago, right? And, and teaching him how he can monetize what he does in his artwork. So, I mean, it's just Love it. it's incredible. I mean, I, I find that I get more leads and more interest, although I, I deal almost exclu exclusively on referral, but I'm getting more interest from just things like forums like this, giving out content that we can share and make each other better and not, not try to ring the bell and start the clock on, on an hourly rate, right? That People don't want that. Right. Dr. Joe, and that's why I thought Doug would be so great because <clears throat> what I've noticed in my my uh, experience of investing is is a lot, lot is held very very close to the vest and almost a scarce mindset where Doug has always been open and sharing information that we could all use, but yet a lot of people investment. Um, companies will hold that tight until you sign the dotted line. Like we're not going to give you any free information, God forbid, until you join our forces and, and allow us to earn commission off of you where he's abundantly been sharing a lot of this, um, this information and um, really, really enjoy following what he does on social media. But Doug, I've got a question before we get off of this. Um, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's about trust, right? And it's about Robin Hood. And it's about that those deal flows that these companies are paying exorbitant amounts of money. And, and shame on me, right? I, we talked about this a little bit before you jumped on. You know, did I read the terms and policies closely enough to really understand what was happening? Did I think thoroughly about how does Robin Hood actually make money? You know, my mindset was, well, it's probably a venture play that they're going to figure out how to monetize down the road once they have enough subscribers to it. But can you help me understand this this deal flow that they're that they're selling off to the hedge funds? Um, you know, I always hate to start a, a response with I can't. Um, I'm honestly not expert enough in the idiosyncrasies of the specifics of Robinhood, but what, I'll, what I will say is that this is not unusual. Um, right. There has been this type of, um, I'll, I'll, I'll use a safe word, arrangement in the industry in various ways, shapes, and forms for forever. Um, the mutual fund industry, which is still probably the largest steward, we use that word carefully, of investors' assets, um, has what's called revenue sharing, okay? 
So if you're buying a mutual fund through any major brokerage firm, chances are that there's a revenue sharing deal in place. Now the brokerage firm justifies it by saying that we're choosing only the best fund companies that our clients can have access to. Well, come on, give me a break. Those days are over, right? Nobody believes that. They're basically opening the door to almost anybody and they want the scale on there and they want the marketing boots on the ground that they can leverage off of uh, to get the most sales in there, you know, get the most clients in the door and therefore the most sales. So they're paying fund company XYZ or they're getting paid by fund company XYZ a percentage of revenue to be on their shelf, right? And so it's the same thing with, with Robinhood. Robinhood, if, if they're not getting paid by you through commissions, which have disappeared, they have to be getting paid somehow. Now, I don't have a problem with right. people being paid, otherwise nothing would work, but it should be disclosed very transparently and fairly. And, you know, I, I take a lot of grief from people who hear what my fee proposal is, which is about, uh, well, it's, let's just say significantly less than most of my competitors, and I typically cap it, um, it depending on what the strategy is, because I don't believe why should I charge someone 10 times when I'm charging someone else just because they have a million dollars versus a guy with $100,000 if it takes me the same amount of time to manage their money, right? Incrementally, yeah. if it's more complex, sure. But if it takes me the same amount of time to manage Joe's money versus Sally's money, why should it be vastly different? Why should it be a factor of 10? I don't believe in that. Um, and I think the industry is starting to change to, you know, to charge in a much different way. And you're seeing new innovative companies pop up and not just financial services, but other companies that are somewhat related. And, and this is gonna flatten the landscape. It's gonna, it's democratizing just about every service out there. Hmm. It's fascinating. Which is, which is what Robinhood was supposed to be doing, right? Democratizing for the yeah. retail investor. Well, yeah, they democratized certain areas, but other areas were, you know, I guess it sounds to me like not everybody was in the know around the uh, financial arrangements. No, and that'll be the interesting stuff that's being talked about at these Senate hearings if they, if they ever get off the ground. Is there any truth in the advanced information from the Robinhood retail investors being able to use that in a speedy way that if I were to buy a Tesla share at $850, that by the time it goes through the hands of the hedge funds, I actually am buying it for $850.50 per share. Um, yeah, you're, you're getting into weeds that I can't really untangle. Um, I mean, I will say that, you know, paying for order flow is not unusual. And, you know, in fact, it, it's, been, it's been so competitive over the last even decade that people were paying a premium just to have their physical building located a block closer to the exchange because you would get a nanosecond edge on your competitors in terms of trade execution. Now that to me is, you know, the, the quants, the rocket scientists will argue, well, that's helping market efficiency. Come on, a nanosecond? I mean, the velocity of those trades and the turnover that the that they have to have to actually make money on that is incredible. And I, I just intuitively, I find that to smack of being unhealthy. I don't, I don't see how that's healthy for markets, but I'm not the I, rocket scientist. I'm, I'm just a simple guy in Hingham running money for people. Very nice of you. I, I've got one last question. How'd you come up with the name Tailwind? <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I, I love the water, I love boating, but I, I was, I was, it was kind of a, converg a convergence of that, but starting with thinking what sort of tailwinds do investors need to help them perform better? Um, and that's, that's really how I came up with the name. Um, it's probably not super intuitive, so it may not be a marketing genius's uh, first choice, but I'm not a marketing genius either. I think it's great. Um, this may be completely inappropriate, but I'm sure your dad must be really proud of you, you know, about something. So sorry. He was an investor as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks so much for starting off that way and telling yeah, us how important today was. 
for you. I appreciate the invite, guys. A good show, and uh, thank you for the great questions and even the few that I couldn't answer. I, I did my best. We'd love to have you back, all right? Thank Thanks you. so much, right. Doug. Appreciate Thanks a it. bunch, Doug. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Bye. Stretch the canvas, brush with